Hello everyone. Today, I will be introducing to you the concept of conditional probability. This concept of conditional probability is crucial for doing certain calculations with probabilities, as we will see. And furthermore, it is a crucial step towards understanding what's called Bayes' theorem. And we will talk about Bayes' theorem starting next week. And that is a very important upshot of our study of probability theory in this class. In this video, though, what we're going to focus on is mastering the concept of conditional probability, which includes its uh, official definition, so the formal definition of what conditional probability is, and we'll also be talking about how to apply that definition to various cases. But we'll begin with an intuitive example of a certain kind of calculation or a certain kind of question we might ask about probabilities that we need conditional probability to answer in a rigorous way. So in this first video of the lecture, I will talk about an intuitive motivation for why we need to think about conditional probability, and that is an example from Laplace. Then I will give the official definition of conditional probability um, and try to explain some of the uh, ideas behind the formalism. Then in the next video of, the, that, of this lecture, I will be applying this uh, definition to calculate formally various probabilities, and we will conclude by considering again the example from the beginning. So let us get started. Here is an example from the probability theorist Laplace. Suppose that there are two urns of marble. So suppose that in front of you there are two different urns. And in those urns there are marbles. Now we know that in the first urn, suppose the urn to your left, urn one, there are three red marbles and one green marble. Now suppose that in the second urn, to your right, there is one, uh, one red marble and three green. So in each of these two urns in front of you, there's a different distribution of red versus green marbles. Now here is uh, an experiment we might uh, perform. What we could do is we could take a coin we have in our pocket, which we know is a fair coin, and we could flip it. And depending on how the, the coin lands, we would then choose one of these two urns to draw from. Now in this case, I want you to suppose that when we flip the coin, we will then draw from one of the two urns twice with replacement. So for instance, if the coin lands heads, we'll draw twice from urn one, um, and each end between the, the first and the second draw, we'll put back the, the, what we drew and then draw again. So that is the width replacement. We replace the marble we draw on the first, uh, the first draw, and then we shake it up and then draw again for the second. But if, we, if the coin lands tails, we'll do the same thing, but from urn two. So now we can ask the following question. If we were to do this experiment, if we were to flip a fair coin to choose one of the urns, and then from that urn we choose based on the coin toss, we make, we make two draws with replacement. In that case, what is the probability of getting two reds? I.e., what is the probability of the first and the second draw being reds, being red uh, marbles? So again, the question is as follows. We haven't flipped the coin yet, so we don't know which urn we'll be drawing from. But we can ask the general question of, regardless of how the coin flip, how the coin flip lands, and regardless, therefore, of knowing exactly which of the two urns we'll be drawing from, what is the overall probability of, if we perform this overall experiment of flipping a coin and drawing twice from one of the urns, 
what is the overall probability of getting two reds in a row? So here is a preliminary way of calculating the answer to that question. And we will, we will return to this calculation at the end of this lecture once we have the notion of conditional probability. But before we have that precise notion on the table, here is the preliminary answer to the overall probability of getting two reds if, we're, if we are to flip a fair coin and then choose one of the two urns to draw from. And what you have to note is that there are two mutually exclusive ways, let's call them X and Y, of getting two reds. What are those two ways? Well, first, with X, we draw two reds from urn one. The other way is that we draw two reds from urn two. So whichever way the coin flip lands, we'll either be drawing from urn one or, or urn two. So that means that there's two uh, possible ways of drawing two reds. The first way is that you're drawing them from urn one, and the second way is that you're drawing them from urn two. And these are, of course, mutually exclusive because the coin is going to land either heads or tails. So you're going to have to be drawing from either urn one or urn two. So what we can do is we can calculate the probability of these two ways, x and y, of getting two reds. And then since we know they're mutually exclusive, we know that the overall probability of drawing two reds is equal to the sum of the probabilities of these two, the two mutual, mutually exclusive ways of getting two reds. So what is the probability of drawing two reds from urn one? Well, first off, there's a half chance that the coin will land heads. So we put one half to signal that there, first, uh, first, there's one half of a chance that the coin will land heads. And then once the coin lands heads and we start drawing from urn one, because three out of the four marbles are, are red, and because we're taking each draw with replacement, we have two uh, three quarters chance of drawing a red. So first there's one half chance of drawing, of the coin landing heads and therefore that we draw from urn one. Then once we start drawing from urn one, on the first draw, there's a three quarter chance of drawing a red. And then on the second draw, there is a three quarter chance of drawing a red again. So we just multiply up these three probabilities, and that gives us a nine over 32 chance of, uh, the, of X, which is the case in which you are drawing from urn one and you draw two reds. Now we do a very similar calculation for Y. So because the coin is fair, there's a half a chance it lands heads, and there's also a half a, half a chance it lands tails, which is to say that there's a half a chance that we draw from urn two. And now with urn two, there are four marbles, but there's only one red out of those four. So that means when we start drawing from urn two, there's only a one quarter chance of drawing a red uh, on each of the draws. So we multiply one quarter by one quarter for each of those draws. And what we get as a result is that the probability of drawing two reds from urn two is uh, one three two one over three two given this setup where we first again flip a coin to decide which uh, urn to draw from and now because x and y are the mutually exclusive ways of getting two reds because we have exhausted the possibilities of however the coin lands and then for each way the coin might land what the probabilities are of getting two reds, what we can do is we just sum up the probabilities of X and Y to get us the probability of drawing two reds. So to unpack this a bit more, the probability of getting two reds is the same as the probability of X or Y because drawing two reds uh, are, are here following the convention, which I discussed in previous lecture that is equivalent to X or Y because X and Y are the, are the two ways of it being possible to draw two reds in this setup. 
And then furthermore, because X uh, and Y are mutually exclusive, you have to either draw from earn one or earn two. We can calculate their the probability of their disjunction by su uh, summing up the uh, probabilities of the disjuncts. And this is a rule which I introduced in the previous lecture. And then here I've reasoned through the probability of each of X and Y. So we simply just uh, put them in here, then add them up. So what we get is simplifying is that the probability of drawing two reds in their overall setup is five over 16. But now there's one question which we can raise, which is that how exactly did we arrive at these numbers for the probability of X and the probability of Y? And the answer is that we relied on the concept of conditional probability. So the probability of drawing a red is three quarters if you're drawing from earned one. And the probability of a red is one quarter if you're drawing from earned two. So we might ask, how do we, how do these conditional probabilities work? How do we arrive at them? So to put this a bit uh, more clearly, in calculating the probability of X, we think about first the probability of the coin lending heads, which is one half, and that is an unconditional probability because you simply flip the coin. But then we're assuming that, we're, that the coin does lend heads and we're drawing from earn one. And when or if we're drawing from earn one, the probability of drawing a red is three quarters. And similarly, if we're drawing from earn two, the probability of drawing a red is one quarter. So these numbers we've, we, these numbers we've stuck in here are um, conditional probabilities. And what, I will, what we're gonna be introducing today is how these work formally. So in the remainder of this video, I will introduce to you the definition of conditional probability. But first, why care about conditional probability? Well, the main reason is that conditional probability is central to inductive logic. So as stressed at the beginning of this class in unit one, and also stressed last week when I, when I introduced probability theory, the main thing we can use probability for is to understand this inductive strength of arguments. So not all arguments are 100% deductively valid. Not all good arguments are such that their premises guarantee as a matter of logic, the truth of the conclusion. Rather, many arguments are simply inductively strong. That is to say that many arguments make the premise, sorry, many arguments are such that their premises make the conclusion very likely. And that is to say, we must ask about many arguments, how probable is the conclusion if the premises are true? And that if is precisely the if of conditional probability. We're asking how likely is the conclusion conditional on the premises? Now, another reason why we want to get a good handle on conditional probability is that we can use it to define independence, which is an important concept that came up last week. And we'll, we will return to this shortly. Now, formally, as a, very, as a very preliminary introduction, the way we write the conditional probability of A given B or the conditional probability of A on B is with this extension of the probability function. So, in other, in simple examples, for unconditional probability, we simply have the, as in here, we simply have the probability function PR with a single argument. So here, for instance, we're asking about the probability of X. But now for conditional probability, we have a straight bar that goes between the two arguments. So here, the conditional probability function takes two arguments, so we ask about the probability of A given B. But now it's to, you have to note that just like a, the unconditional probability operator can take any different sentences of different complexity, so can the, the conditional probability operator. So 
we can we don't have to just talk about the conditional probability of a sentence letter a given a sentence letter b rather we can talk about the conditional probability of any sentence phi no matter how complex uh, conditional on any sentence psi, no matter how complex these two sentences are. And the general definition of what the probability of phi given psi is, is the ratio of the probability of phi and psi uh, over the probability of psi. So that is to say that the probability of phi given psi is equal to the probability of the conjunction of phi and psi divided by the probability of psi. So the very first thing to note about this formula is that this formula is undefined when the probability of psi, when the unconditional probability of psi is zero because you cannot divide by zero. So you cannot apply this definition when the probability of psi is zero. But this makes sense because intuitively, if there's no chance that psi is true, it doesn't make sense to ask whether phi is likely given psi. So in the next video, I will work through some calculations with this definition and also give a bit more intuitive uh, explanation of how it works.